The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 passes the Senate and now heads to the House and eventually to the president's desk for signature. Democrats have been desperate to put some points on the board, and the secret negotiations between Senator Joe Manchin and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer pushed the bill closer to the finish line. It begs the question, after holding up the bill for months, just what did Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema get to come on board? Welcome to The Money Runner. I'm David Nelson. Manchin held out for a while. In fact, the secret negotiations between Schumer and the senator were a surprise to everyone, including Senator Sinema, who appeared not to know what was going on when it was first announced. But once she figured it out, she was very quick to ask for something in return. Before we get into that, let's look at what this bill will do. The bill will provide tax incentives uh, to reduce carbon emissions and for the first time allow Medicare to negotiate the price of certain drugs. To help pay for the above, the bill establishes a 15% corporate minimum tax. First of all, if, if you wanna pass climate and tax legislation and, and you have the votes, go for it, but own it. Calling it an Inflation Reduction Act is an insult to my intelligence. Here's a summary from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. The Penn Wharton budget model and CBO find an almost identical impact of the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 on the budget. Here's the key line. The impact on inflation is statistically indistinguishable from zero. Even Senator Sanders can smell the coffee. From the Hill, reporting on what Senator Sanders said on the floor of the Senate. According to the Congressional Budget Office and other economic organizations that have studied this bill, it will have a minimal impact on inflation. So what did Joe and Kirsten get for coming on board? Let's dig into it. On August 7th, the New York Times wrote an op-ed on what Manchin would receive. He got a pipeline, that was it. He got a pipeline in his own backyard. The New York Times reported that the Senator was promised a pipeline in his home state and expedited approval for pipelines and other infrastructure nationwide. So what did Senator Sinema get? I think she actually got the better deal. The Senator managed to have language in the bill that would hit the pocketbooks of private equity and hedge fund managers who often receive the bulk of their compensation in the form of carried interest income taken out, right? According to the Financial Times, the Senator has received more than a half million dollars from private equity industry this election cycle. All right, I'm gonna have to explain what this is because it's a little complicated. For the uninitiated, carried interest is the share of profits a private equity or hedge fund manager would receive. A typical arrangement is two and 20. The manager receives a 2% annual fee on assets under management and a 20% share of the profits. If the fund makes 10% in a given year, 20% of that return or 2% of the total would go directly to, to the general partner. It's taxed differently and treated the same as investments in the fund and subject to capital gains tax which is almost always lower and a lot cheaper than the tax on ordinary income, which you and I pay. Efforts to kill this giveaway, an unfair loophole that benefits the real 1%, that's been going on uh, for decades. Somehow, the private equity lobby always gets their way in protecting this gift. Getting rid of this loophole in our tax code is probably the only thing I supported in this bill. Even Trump tried to get rid of it while he was putting together the tax bill of 2017. He failed because the lobby was able to hold up the bill and likely never would have been passed if it hadn't been eliminated. As for the 1% tax on stock buybacks, this is just the beginning. You can bet there will be calls to increase it over time. Now, my view on stock buybacks is not gonna be what you think. The bigger issue is that stock buybacks have their roots in a deeper problem, stock option grants. I've long been an outspoken critic against stock buybacks and for much of my career. I can probably sum up my thoughts with a look at my response to the Wall Street Journal editorial board's op-ed in favor of stock buybacks uh, came from this weekend. Before I go into my opposition, let me give you their side of the story. 
and a definition on just what a stock buyback is. A stock buyback is when a public company like Apple or IBM goes into the open market and buys back their own shares. This reduces the number of shares outstanding, and even if the net income of the corporation doesn't increase, the earnings per share, or EPS, does because there are just fewer shares outstanding. Those that support it say it's a, a way for the company to return cash that they effectively can't use. Look, I'll be the first to admit that some companies need to buy back some of their stock. App Apple is the perfect example. They're just too large. This year, Apple will generate $118 billion in cash from operations. That's too much. There's no way they could deploy all that capital, and they need to return some of that to, to, the, to the shareholders. But for most other companies, they don't fit that description. The ugly truth of stock buybacks is that it's often code that the CEO, CEO has run out of ideas on how to better grow the company, and the easiest way to hit performance-based compensation targets like earnings per share is to authorize a stock buyback. Remember, a buyback, it does nothing for revenue. It does nothing for net income. It only gooses earnings per share because you reduce the number of shares outstanding. There's one more reason they're forced to do it. Even if the CEO wasn't trying to make it easier to hit his performance target, he the financial pressure to buy back shares to offset the dilution of all the stock option grants management receives. A CEO might only receive a salary of a million dollars or a few million dollars. And I know that sounds like a lot of money, but the bigger part of his or her compensation is often in stock options that can be exercised and sold for cash. Another way to look at this is some of the stock being bought back in the open market are being sold by a CEO. I'll give you an example. In 2019, Alphabet CEO Pakai received a total compensation package of $280 million. You heard that right, $280 million. Trust me. His salary wasn't that high, and you can bet a lot of that came from stock-based compensation. The poster child of this type of behavior was IBM, which wasted billions in stock buybacks every year to grow EPS instead of reinvesting in the company. And today, it's just a shell of its former self. Airlines, they spent billions as well. They spent billions buying their stock back in the years running up to COVID. And the American taxpayer, you and I, we ended up footing that bill. Look at this table of IBM from 2008 till the present. They bought back over a hundred billion in company stock. Today, their market cap is just 119 billion. They could have bought back, they could have bought a lot of young companies and revamped the company to be more in tune with the technology needs of today. I've been running money for better than 25 years and I've been hearing this same old tired excuse uh, for buybacks my entire career. Most of those touting their, their usefulness, they're on the inside receiving the benefit. Think about that. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thanks so much for joining. I'll see you again next week. And of course, tomorrow morning on the Market Minute. Have a great night. I'm David Nelson.